points in church history, different things are being focused on. So that's what I'm going to be looking at. Also, something that was helpful to me looking at church history was, um, yeah, what uh, the impulse of Christianity, I'd say, the missionary impulse, the gospel impulse, whatever you want to call it, um, and how it interacted with history. So what was helpful for me looking at that kind of uh, missionary impulse, when I say that, I mean like uh, the gospel, going out and preaching the good news. What Jesus said at the end of Matthew, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. And that's a very, um, I'd say like straight line, right? It's a very easy concept to do. You go out, you teach them that Jesus Christ died for your sins, put you from the dead. Um, and that brings forth a new life. But when you're looking at it, and, you, and when you look at the history of the church, and the history of Jesus uh, inside of the world, you see that it's not just that. Like Christianity immediately, as soon as it hits into history, begins to draw different aspects of history into itself and different things itself into itself. So we have like as soon as history hits or Christianity hits history, it draws in Greek thought along with it very, very quickly into its orbit. We also have as soon as Christianity hits history, it draws in different forms of government into it. And it brings these things Whatever can be brought into alignment with Christianity, it brings into alignment with Christianity. Um, and so I think this is what I'm going to be talking about mainly for this first time period of Christianity, this 8050 to 8150. We're talking about how Christianity drew along these different streams of thought that it found itself in. And we see this, Christianity does this throughout all of church history, throughout all of time. I mean, we even see it right now inside of America, I'd say it's pretty obvious in America that Christianity took a lot of different institutions and made them look more like Christ, right? So we have, <coughs> like democracy is a good example. It's a, very, it's a form of government that's very useful for Christianity. We also see just how Christianity changed the laws in different countries, especially in America, making laws more just, making laws more merciful, making laws look generally more Christian. And this is what Christianity does throughout history. I like it as a straight, I think of it like as an arrow, shooting through uh, history, and like as a slipstream, everything else kind of follows it. Or whatever else can follow it, decides to follow it throughout history. Whatever can be redeemed is brought into redemption. And whatever can't be redeemed kind of gets left behind so easily, like, uh, what would we say? Uh, trying to be a thief. Like that, that's uh, something that cannot be redeemed in, by the Christian impulse, so it kind of gets left behind. But government, can it be redeemed by the Christian impulse? I'd say it can be drawn closer to the Christian impulse, be drawn closer to look more like Christ. I think that's what we see throughout church history. So, that being said, did that any of that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes okay. sense. Makes sense. <laughs> Following. This is all uh, out, of, out of the dome, so... That being said, that's kind of what I'm looking at as I'm studying church history. We'll start into the time period itself, 8050 to 8150. And I'll immediately start with an uh, apology or like a defense for what this time period. When I started this, I said I wouldn't be talking about the Book of Acts. I'm going to be mentioning the Book of Acts. I like, I, you know, as I was practicing this lesson and really looking into it, it was like the history that I'm looking at, 8050 to 150. Paul's still alive in AD 15. <laughs> um, Paul dies around AD 65. And the book of Acts really does have a lot of the history that we actually have from this time period. So it has the history of missions, uh, or at least the missions that Paul does during this time period. It has the, the history of um, the intellectual life of the Christians during this time. So I'll be referencing it during this time period. But frustratingly, 8050 to 8150 doesn't have that many uh, documents that Christians themselves wrote about this time period. Actually, there's only like a handful of documents during this time period that we do have and that were handed down to us. Why is that? You know, I think looking back on it from where we are, the Christian life, like Christianity is so big now, like half of the world claims to be a Christian. Why is there no documents from that time period? <laughs> I think mainly because the Christians from this time period were poor, or poorer, which generally meant illiterate. They couldn't actually write. Um, 
Also, there was a history of persecutions that we'll talk about later on, but it makes it hard to write down a lot of stuff whenever you're trying not to be killed. Um, and also, it was just new. Like, there wasn't that many Christians to begin with, so they were more focused on, I think, the life of the church and the life, like, what we're doing here instead of, like, writing massive documents about the history of Christianity because that really just, yeah, they didn't have the time, they didn't have the resources to do so. So, what we do have is a lot of documentary evidence of what it was like to be a Christian during this time period. So I'm going to be referencing a lot of uh, contemporary sources and more of the culture that Christianity found itself in during this time period. It wasn't so much that we have the documents, like I said, from the Christians themselves, but we do have documents from Roman authors talking about what life was like in Rome during this time. We have documents from Jewish authors saying what it was like to be a Jew, and we have also documents from Greek thinkers talking about the intellectual life of Rome during this time. And since this is what Christianity found itself in whenever it started, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, I'm going to be talking mainly about those three aspects of Roman life and the world that Christianity found itself in. So, to start, we're going to talk a little bit about the Roman culture that Christianity found itself in. So, what was Rome like AD 50? Well, we have Augustus Caesar. Not to be mixed up, as I often do with Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was around AD 0 BC times. He became a dictator, as if you, if you know the Shakespearean play about him, and was eventually killed and murdered by the people uh, that he thought were his friends. And that actually sparked a long history of civil wars in Rome during that time period. Everybody was trying to get a piece of the Roman Empire. It was nasty, brutal, bloody. People couldn't really... I mean, just remember, think about America during the American Civil War. It's that kind of mentality and that kind of life that was going on right before Christianity, Jesus uh, inserted himself into the history of the world. A.D. 50, though, Augustus Caesar shows up, and he reunites the Roman world underneath his rule. He is another dictator. We can't win it all. But he is a peaceful dictator, and he ushers in the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome. And this very useful for Christians, uh, especially the Christian impulse going into the Roman Empire. I think as we study this period, we'll see when Jesus says that I came in the fullness of time, or whenever the Bible says that Jesus came in the fullness of time, we'll see that this is very much the case with just all the cultural factors that were surrounding Christianity. It was very, very amenable to the spread of Christianity and the missionary impulse for Christians. So, we have Pax Romana, meaning at least in the side of the Roman Empire, which goes from about, I'm going to draw a very bad map, <laughs> prepare yourselves. It goes about from Spain, through France, down to Italy, down through Greece, Israel, up through Africa and Egypt, to North Africa. That is a bad map. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so clearly Europe, right? Um, <laughs> but this is about the expanse of the Roman Empire. Yeah, Ireland. Rome kind of encapsulates all of this land from Africa, northern Africa down to Sahara, Egypt down to. Ethiopia, Israel, <laughs> that's over there, mm -hmm. Greece, that's over here, Italy, Spain, France, Germany. It's about what Rome rules. And for the people living in this time period, this is basically the entire world for them. Like, it's the whole known world. They, could, they know about India and China, but it's, that's <coughs> kind of out of the way. And honestly, unifying this whole area is an impressive feat. I mean, we don't even have that going on right now. And especially unifying it under peace. So, what does this bring? It brings the Roman roads, which were already kind of a factor during this time period, but the roads were uh, expanding. And these roads made it, as you can imagine, very easy for missionaries to travel on. <laughs> um, and especially since the roads were uh, well guarded during this time period because of the Pax Romana, it meant that the people could travel on it without a 
deep fear of being loved and robbed, which is a very useful thing to do. It also meant that there was a great deal of merchant activity going on. Actually, during this time period in Rome, there was an economic boom happening. Again, because of the peace and also because Rome had conquered a lot of different territories outside of its land, which meant they were getting a lot of gold from those uh, German, Germanic tribes, kind of like Persian tribes. But because there was an economic boom, that meant that there was a lot of economic trade going on. And we actually see in the history of Christianity that all of these uh, kind of merchant centers is where Christianity first started springing up. So when Christianity, and we even see with Paul, right? Paul from Antioch. Antioch was a uh, merchant center. It was a very, it was a big city. There was a lot of foot travel going through it. And this is how Christianity generally spread from the beginning. Okay? It went out from Israel and kind of hit all these different merchant centers throughout the world. I mean, getting as far as Spain, like we have from Paul in the Book of Romans, mm -hmm. that he was wishing to go to Spain and talk to the Christians living inside of Spain. So we see very early on, because of this peace inside of Rome and because of this economic <coughs> Christianity being able to push itself out into the Roman world at a very rapid, rapid pace. And that was a huge blessing to the church in general. And it was where Christianity found itself. And it kind of shaped the character of Christianity. Because, and we even see this nowadays, new ideas tend to stick faster inside of cities than they do in the country. Like, for better or for worse, I'd say in this case, it's for better that Christianity was able to stick in the minds of <coughs> city dwellers. But just in general, cities, people who live in cities are more amenable to new ideas coming out. And we see that because it took a while to convert the countrysides of Rome, but did not take that long to convert uh, more swaths of the city of Rome. Which is funny because now we think about Christianity as being like mainly a rural thing and the cities being the ones kind of uh, moving away from the light of God. Yeah. But at least during at Rome during this time, it was found to be the opposite. Another important aspect of Rome was its religious makeup. So Rome during this time was actually a very syncretistic culture, meaning it was willing to take what it liked and keep that, and take the stuff it didn't like and kind of put it off to the side. So in Rome, in the, especially in the religious mindset, they kind of just worshipped whatever they wanted. They thought, shoot, like, it was kind of like the way we think nowadays, like you do you, like you worship what you want to worship, I'll worship what I want to worship. Honestly, the only thing that was really startling to the Romans um, and the culture at large was that Christianity wasn't that way. Christianity was like, hey, look, like we're going to worship God because God says, I'm, you know, I'm the only one. I Behold, I'm the Lord. You shall have no other gods before me. Rome was very different than this, but it actually turned out to Christianity's favor, at least in the beginning. Because during this time period, there were these uh, religious cults called the Mystery Cults. Also, I'm going too fast. Say slow down. If you have any questions, shoot them out. Like, I'm just going to be <laughs> rambling. So. I can see I'm not going to be able to take no notes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, during this time period, it was, um, like I said, mystery cults. These mystery cults, um, they're strange. Okay. We don't actually know much about them because, per name, they're mystery cults. And these mystery cults, uh, you, they would kind of, the, it's kind of like Freemasonry during our time period. Like they go and they do their thing, and most people have no idea what's going on behind the closed doors. And to this day, we don't have that much of an idea. What we do know is that they started kind of in the east, in Persia or in Egypt. It was whenever Rome started taking over those countries that they started having this influence from these mystery cults. What were they like? <coughs> Generally, which is kind of it's just interesting for Christianity, they focused on dying and resurrecting gods. So, coming out of Egypt, there was a cult called the Isis and Osiris cult, where Osiris was the god of death and resurrection, and Isis was the god of life. There's also coming out of Mesopotamia, the Attic cults which is, again, a similar thing. They worship the god Atis, and Atis was another god who died and was resurrected. We have the Orphic cult coming
coming out of Rome, which had worshipped Orpheus, and if you know the story of Orpheus, he went down into Hades to find his wife, to try to like win her back by singing. I forget if it worked or not. I don't but think he it went did. down into Hades and came back. What? I don't think it did. It didn't work. Okay. Yeah. Well, he tried to get his wife out of Hades. Didn't work. But it was a similar thing. Dying and resurrecting. So, when Christianity... And they're also very secretive. So they have, they have their own little um, cultic meetings. Nobody really knew what was going on in them. But they kept having them. And this is kind of the life one of the cults. Actually, we do know in one cult, they would uh, butcher a bull. And they would hang it above the people going into the place. They'd slit its throat. People would walk under the blood. And the blood would... Uh, kind of cleanse them from different sins. But this came after Christianity, so I yep. think it may that was borrowing from Christian imagery. Be that as may, the Romans here, the Roman government here is that the Christ, there's a new religion focusing on a dying and resurrected God that's coming from the East. They're like, okay, well I've heard this <laughs> I've heard this one before. We don't have to be too worried that it's gonna be a religion that's gonna be super disruptive to our culture or to how we live because it's just the same as these other mystery cults, right? And that was very useful because it allowed Christianity to kind of uh, go under the radar because if you begin to look into Christian morals, while it does say worship, uh, not worship the emperor, give the emperor his dues, be good citizens, pay your taxes, it also does say we will not worship the emperor and the emperor is not God and the Roman Empire greatly did not like that. But that comes in later. As for now, Christianity is confused with the, the other mystery cults that are going on. And it is actually a good thing. In the eyes of the government, That's a, for us, that's a good thing. Also during this time period, there's the Stoics. Um, which is kind of religion, kind of a way of thought. It's like in the water nowadays. Like a lot of people I meet are talking about Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and Seneca. Basically, the idea of Stoicism is an overriding view of providence, or that the world is governed by an intelligence. It's what's going to happen is what's going to happen, so you might as well just go along with it. Nothing you can do to stop it. And it's interesting about Stoicism that it was embraced by a Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, and also by his slave, Epictetus. The two highest degrees, of, the greatest difference in degree, slave to emperor, both of them embrace this kind of philosophy. And it kind of makes sense. Marcus Aurelius viewed this philosophy, and he, I don't think Marcus Aurelius liked his job. He's an emperor, right? He was the emperor. Mm -hmm. He did not want to be an emperor. Um, I think he kind of hated it. And a lot of this time was saying, look, you're in this role. You just got to play it out. Like, you're given this by providence. Continue on, do what you want. Same thing with Epictetus as a slave. He says, look given this role, work it out, and move along with it. Again, this is useful for Christianity because we have a very large uh, view, of, high view of providence as well. Difference being, our view of God is a good God, that he is working things out for our good and for our benefit, and working things out for our salvation, whereas the Stoic God is kind of just indifferent. It's you don't really know why the God's doing what it's doing, if it even is a God, and at the end of time, there's going to be a giant fire, and everything's going to restart and recycle. So it's kind of a hopeless view of the world. But for Christianity, like I said at the beginning, it can take what's good and leave what's bad. So for the missionaries going out into the world at this time, they can say, hey, look, I, you guys believe in providence. Like, we also believe in a form of providence, but we believe in a better form. Of providence, whereas for the uh, Stoics, they don't have that. Uh, also, what's important to note for the spread of Christianity in Rome at this time was the drastic differences in um, wealth and lifestyle at this time. The slave population in Rome was growing and growing during this time period, and it was a vast pool of misery the slaves living in this time. It was not, you could, if you were a slave, the Rome, a Roman, <clears throat> anybody can come to you and put you to the question, is what they call it, which means torture. If they want to get an idea, uh, what do you say, an idea from you, or uh, especially during Roman law courts, if you have slaves, 
and the people in charge, the judges, can take the slaves and just torture them to try to get information out of them. And it was actually believed that they wouldn't just lie to make the pain stop. But it was a miserable time to be a slave in Rome. And this, again, worked out for Christianity's favor. Because Jesus said, go to the least of these. Mm -hmm. right? And Christianity always takes that very seriously. And honestly, the least of these have always been the ones who are more inclined to listen mm -hmm. to Christianity. And because there's such a large portion of the strata of society that never even had a religion preached to them, the mystery cults were never preached to the slaves. They were only for the middle or upper, upper class. Stoicism, while it was embraced by a slave, generally was not. It was more of an intellectual kind of system. And the slaves lived their lives in pain. And they lived their lives as another person's property. They could be manumitted. But even then, you'd be released and become a freeman or a freed slave. And again, that's not, you're still at only a strata above slave. Your options are still very much tied. And we know for a fact that Christianity's early believers were all part of this, were, ma were mainly part of the slave population. Um, and it was also for women as well, because women in the Roman society were not treated well at all. Um, and were also viewed as secondary citizens and people. So women were drawn to Christianity as well because it preached a universal religion. Anybody could be saved. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and drawn to his kingdom. Whereas the mystery cults, was, there's also kind of a price point trying to get into mystery cults, even though they did offer a type of salvation, or so they claim. And stoicism, which isn't even really a salvation, it's just like suck it up, like life will get better in time. So Christianity, when it hit this religious spectrum, preached a gospel that is, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. We all, we all believe in the gospel. So, But it's interesting to note the religious history during this time, or the religion during this time period. So that is a very fast snapshot of the Roman Empire when Christianity found it and kind of moved into it during this time period. That was only one of the cultural aspects that Christianity found itself in. Another important aspect that Christianity found itself in, which is kind of, it makes a lot of sense, but also we don't really think about it, was the Jewish milieu that Christianity found itself in. we know about Judaism from the Bible, right? And Christianity always saw itself, or at least Jesus saw himself as a reformer of the Jewish religion, or as a bringing the Jewish religion back into itself fully, right? Like, it was never meant to... It wasn't meant to replace Judaism as much as it was to revive Judaism and make it what it's supposed to be. The worship of God um, in spirit and in truth. Problem was... oh. Jewish priest here. <laughs> Problem was, well, I mean, Jesus was killed, right? <laughs> like, the Jews did not like what Christianity was doing to the religion, and this carried through <clears throat> for a very long time in church history, but especially during this time period from 8050 to 150, it was a big question for the Christians of this time. How do we interact with the Jewish culture and the Jewish elements that we find ourselves in. In the same way that Christianity kind of moved along the merchant routes to the major cities, Judaism during this time period did the same thing. They moved to different synagogues and different cities. And this is where, as we see from Paul, naturally Christianity started. Paul goes into a city, what does he do? Preaches at the synagogue in order to convert the Jews first. And this was generally the method used, as far as we know, from Christians during this time period. You go to the synagogue to try to convince the Jewish people that Jesus is the Messiah. There's, there's more background that you can work with with the Jews than there is with the Romans, right? You can point to different points of Scripture and be like, hey, this is how Jesus fulfills the Scripture. Hey, this is how the Messiah has actually come. Let me tell you about it. Whereas with Romans, it was more... Yeah, like I said before, trying to gain different, uh, like, hey, uh, you believe in providence, I believe in providence, hey, 
Do you believe in dying and resurrecting God? Let me tell you about the real dying and resurrecting God. Be that as may, when the Christians end up in the synagogues, as we know from the book of Acts and from other out secondary sources during this time period, it was ball time. Right? When Paul ends up getting stoned and beaten and whipped multiple times because of his interaction with the Jews in the synagogue. They don't really want anything to do with Christianity during this time. They know exactly that Christianity means to a lot of their culture. Especially when Paul is preaching. Paul saying, look, you don't have to follow the ceremonial laws. It's, it's adiaphora. What really matters is living a life in faith towards God, expressing itself through love. The Jewish culture didn't really want anything to do with this because it meant the death of their own culture. But what is, and also, it was Christianity was kind of uh, sheep stealing during this time period because there's those who were interested in the Jewish religion during this time period. They were called friends of God, like the non-Jewish ethnic people. They would go to the synagogue and they would listen to the preaching. From what we can gather, a lot of them really liked the antiquity of the Jewish scriptures, um, like 2,000-year-old thing. Tradition meant a lot more back then than it does now. They also liked the strong moral codes of the Jewish religion, so like the Decalogue and the... That's the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, yep. They really liked that portion of it. What they didn't like was being circumcised, which makes sense. <laughs> they also didn't like not being able to eat pork and the other ceremonial laws. So they would go to the synagogues and listen. And we actually, again, see it in the book of Acts. Paul would go to these areas, and he would preach the true gospel, saying, like, hey, look, you can be circumcised. You cannot be circumcised. If you get circumcised thinking that's going to save you, you're in for a rough surprise. But if you are circumcised and you want to be saved, that's fine. You know, the lovers of God, these Greek and Roman non-Jewish ethnic background people, when they heard Paul preaching, it's like, well, hey, <laughs> like, I can get the entirety of, I can get the true aspects of this religion without having to, you know, follow through with all the ceremonial laws. The Jews naturally didn't take well to this, um, coupled with what they viewed as a throwing away of the entirety of the ceremonial laws, which often did happen with the Greek and Roman converts. It put them at loggerheads. And they would fight often over these different aspects. And we, we, have, we know this because in Rome during this time, one of the Roman historians was like, look, the Jews are rioting again. I don't know why, except about this guy called Crestus. Um, we don't know quite what's happening, but we have to go put out this fire. Of course, Crestus, everyone would be like, oh, man, like that's Christ, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's almost certainly. So we know that this was a problem during this time period. But also, what's interesting for Christianity is that until AD 70, the temple was still around, right? Yeah. Which was the intellectual, religious, just the entire hub of the Jewish religion was based around the temple at Jerusalem because you'd go to the temple and you'd make your sacrifices, right? Christianity, of course, Believing that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, and that there was no, there's no, there's no needed sacrifice after Jesus' death, the temple became a kind of a question mark to Christianity, as you can as you can see. What do you, how do you engage with the temple? How do you engage with the temple worship? If they're sacrificing animals to God, and we believe that Jesus was the final sacrifice, how do we engage with the Jews? who still are doing this temple sacrifice. Interestingly enough, and I'd say providentially, I think Jesus would agree, the temple was destroyed in 870. Jesus actually um, prophesies this in the book of Matthew, right? He's like, look, you see these, towns, these stones, not a single one of them is going to be standing on it, coming in very soon. And that actually plays out. If you read Josephus' history of the Jewish wars, it's, a, it's honestly a tragic, tragic history. Um, the Jews living in Jerusalem during this time were overtaxed. They were given many terrible, terrible governors from the emperor. I was just reading it, and it, uh, it's horrifying what the uh, Roman governors would do to the Jews living in Jerusalem during this time. They would send in um, 
the horse riding armed guards, and they would say, you know, worse, like, worship our emperor. And the Jews would, of course, say, no, and they'd just go and butcher, like, in the streets. So it was just hard to read stuff. So clearly, there's a deep resentment that the Jews have towards the Romans during this time period. That boils out at AD 70. The, um, the faction that wants to end the rule of Rome comes into the forefront, and they strike up a fight against Rome, and Rome at just ends life in Jerusalem, as it was known. They totally raised all of Jerusalem. Like Jesus said, there was literally not a stone left standing on the temple. The Romans would like pick them up and like move them around so that there wasn't any. So it couldn't possibly be brought. This religion couldn't be brought back again in that form. And this is, of course, has massive implications to the Jewish religion. They actually become very much like Christianity a more they call it synagogal style of worship, a more fair style of worship. They began preaching that Christian. Um, that God doesn't need sacrifices, that a pure sacrifice is a lifting of his hands of pure heart, which is all found in the Old Testament. Christianity already believed that, which was, I think, uh, <coughs> useful for Christianity, because that meant whenever Jerusalem was destroyed, they didn't have to engage as much with that stream of thought inside of Judaism. Not that they were engaging over much with those streams of thought uh, to begin with, because most of them were engaging with the uh, synagogal styles of worship in the cities that they were in. But it isn't interesting what could have been if the Jerusalem temple hadn't been destroyed. How would Christianity engage with that? What would the life of... Because we do believe, especially Paul in, the, in Romans, that we want Christ, the Jews to be the first fruits, really, of those who are saved, and we are the ones who've been grafted on. If the temple had stayed, what would it have looked like for Christianity? How Christianity engaged with it, what would it look like for Judaism, we don't really know. It's an interesting what could have been, but I'd say because Jesus prophesied that the temple was going to be destroyed, it had to be destroyed, and I think ultimately worked out for Christianity's good, because it forced all the Christians who were living in Jerusalem to flee Jerusalem, giving an even greater missionary impulse, and it also meant that Christianity didn't have to spend its time focusing on how to engage with the temple worship during this time period. Another important aspect of Jewish thought and Jewish culture during this time was a Jew named... What time is that? 10.09, so you go back. Another time? Cool. There was a Jew named Philo. Philo? Philo. Philo. Yes. He lived in Alexandria. Alexandria is in Egypt. It was a hub. It was an intellectual hub. It was a merchant hub. Whenever Alexander the Great conquered Egypt, he built this city called Alexandria. You probably have heard of the Library of Alexandria that was unfortunately burned. It was a massive cultural force during this time period and for a long time period afterwards. And they say there was upwards of a million Jews living inside of Alexandria during the time of Jesus. Philo was a Jew who lived during the time of Jesus. He was actually a contemporary of Jesus. He was born around AD 0 and lived along the same lines as Paul. They were almost immediate contemporaries. What's interesting about Philo, and we'll talk about this more tomorrow, or tomorrow, sun, next Sunday, the interaction of Greek thought with Christianity. What's interesting is that Philo kind of anticipated a lot of the ways Christianity would interact with Greek thought himself. So for Philo, he had a tendency to allegorize scripture. So in our own culture nowadays, we view scripture as a generally literal book. Most of what it's saying, you can take at face value. You can read it and interpret it that way. For Philo, he's saying no. That's that's a dumb way to interpret scripture. That's a that is a very surface level way to interpret scripture. What's important in scripture is the allegory that it finds. And for Philo, the allegories that he always found were, of course, Platonic thought, which we'll talk about to, uh, next Sunday. But he talked about allegorizing scriptures a lot. He was also a very brilliant 
brilliant man, um, and he had a huge following in Alexandria during this time. Jury's still out about how much he actually uh, impacted Paul, at least, his contemporary. We can see Paul kind of engaging the thought of Philo, um, but we don't really know to what extent Paul was in contact. We know Paul didn't go into Alexandria during his missionary journeys. Some people believe that Apollos, who was mentioned in the Bible at different times, came from Alexandria and was operative in Alexandria during this time period. We don't really know. What we do know is that Philo, oh, excuse me, was living during this time period, was a very deep platonic thinker, tended to allegorize the scripture, and was a Jew, and had a large following of Jews as well in Alexandria during this time period, which Christianity, when it begins to really dig into Alexandria, exploits to its own good uses and good terms. Actually, a lot of Christian authors and writers would reference Philo. Constantly, his allegorical works on Genesis, his allegorical works on the Torah. Some of them actually turned him into a saint, um, not knowing that he was a Jew. Uh, <laughs> so I found that very interesting. Um, but he was a large intellectual beacon for the Jews living during this time period, and I, honestly for Christians as well throughout the history. So it would be remiss not to talk about him. So, I guess in summary, like I said, this time period doesn't have many Christian authors, which is why I didn't really talk about them. I'll be talking about more Christian authors and Christian thoughts later. What I'm trying, what I was trying to do during that was discuss the cultural milieu that Christianity found itself in. Right, it found itself in this Roman culture with these vast differences in wealth, but very amenable to the spreads of new religion during this time period. It was wealthy. So that meant that Christianity could move around very quickly throughout the empire. And it also found itself in contact and uh, at loggerheads with the Jews a lot during this time period. One thing I forgot to mention, actually, so I'll mention it quickly. There's a group of Jews we think were, we don't really know what they taught. They were called Ebionites. They... Jerry was split among their heretics or not. We know for a fact that what really uh, scared a lot of the Gentile Christians about Ebionites was that they followed the law, like the ceremonial law. So they would circumcise, they would um, not eat certain things, they would have strict observation of the Sabbath. <coughs> this naturally kind of scared the Gentile Christians because they're like, well, I don't know why you would bother doing that. But we don't know is if they confess Jesus as God. And that, I mean, has always been kind of the litmus test for Christianity, is if you can confess Jesus as actual God. And since the beginning of Christianity, that has always been, can you confess him as Lord? Do you confess Jesus as Lord? Do you see him as God? And we don't really know if the Ebionites, these Jewish people who they at least viewed him as the Messiah, hmm. they believed that Jesus was, came, and fulfilled the Messiahship that was kind of prophesied in the Old Testament. We don't know if they believed that he was God, but we do know that there was large portions of them during this time period. They eventually started to die off. Problem was, they couldn't really find a niche to fit in. The, the Gentile Christians would usually worship on Sunday. The Jewish believers would worship on Saturday. So they would usually go to the synagogues and worship with Jews, but then the Jews didn't like them because they believed Jesus was the Messiah. So they kind of ostracized them from there. So they'd end up worshiping in their own communities, and eventually they died out. But we can kind of see the impulse of the Ebionites rearing its head all the time with the black Hebrew Israelites during our time, like mm -hmm. right now, like believe fully that the ceremonial law is something you should work, like something you should do and is actually necessary for your salvation. Um, yeah, I think. Please, if any questions, comments too, I'm going too fast. Next time I'll go slower. Let, just let me know. <laughs> and I will try to. And this is for you guys. Yeah. I'm going to have to look up. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, yeah. uh, allegory. It's allegory. like similar or something. Or you know, oh, yeah. 
the story that it'd be, uh, so like we read it, we read the Bible like David David was a person. King David, he actually lived, he actually fought these battles. Yeah. An allegory would be like well he wasn't that was just a, a myth. Like David is really just a symbol of God's triumph in the world. Mm-hmm. And That's his an his his fighting Goliath, Goliath wasn't a real person. It was the it's struggles scary. that we mm-hmm. we face and da- okay. and so yeah. Yeah, figurative. Yeah, that's a good word. And I'll be talking about that a lot more yeah. next Sunday when we talk about Greek thought. Because yeah. that cause <clears throat> Greek thought's very important for the history of Christianity, yeah. really up to 1500 AD. So we'll be going a little more in depth. Thank of you. getting a lot of different thought, mm-hmm. um, where did the scriptures come in that the apostles were writing? Mm-hmm. That's a great question. I should have put that in there. Um, so Paul writing around. Yeah, I don't know how much they were circulated or were available. Sure. So we know very quickly that the writings of Paul were circulated to a lot of the churches during this like early period. They weren't just read by the people in Philippi. They weren't just read by the people in Ephesus where the letters were sent to, they were circulated widely because in AD 100 people are referencing these letters yeah. as scripture. We also know that the gospels were beginning to be uh, written down mm-hmm. during this time period. They would say Matthew was probably written down around AD 90. Mm-hmm. Mark was probably written down around AD 60. Mm-hmm. John was written around AD 90 as well. Um, and they were very quickly adopted and used mm-hmm. by Christians. Like that, but while there was a kind of oral tradition that was being passed along during this time, they also very quickly would use the written scripture as their rules of faith. But that becomes a, more of a problem later in church history, whenever the, uh, they became farther removed from the oral tradition that the apostles gave. Which makes sense, right? Like, if I told you, like, hey, I did this thing yesterday, you would remember it, but if you pass that on to your child... And they pass it on to their child. Mm-hmm. Who knows how garbled that mm-hmm. teaching is going to get? But and then it becomes if, pretty quickly. If you write it down, mm-hmm. and yeah. and then you are inspired by God, you can. It's, <laughs> it's like no, Paul said this, right? And we're still saying that we have the First Corinthians, and we're like Paul said this through uh, God through him. So for the first couple generations, we could rely on the word of mouth traditions fairly well to be accurate, but later on it becomes very quickly a problem. As I'll talk about like the kind of heretical sex that starts springing up to next Sunday, but yeah, it, um, they will they'll mention both oral tradition and the written scriptures during this time period at least, but they do have the scriptures very quickly. Paul died in eighty sixty five, so all of his writings were finished by then, and they were widely circulated. And they were they were seen as scripture. They were seen as scripture, yeah. Very quickly. I mean, we even see that in First Peter, where we'll be going over that soon. But he met Peter talks about Paul's writing. He's like, as all other scripture, it's hard to interpret. But he mentions Paul's writing as scripture, so it's very very quickly seen as authoritative and widely circulated. Did that answer your question? I just know that there was a lot of different things going on as far as beliefs. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, you know, and those were just mentioned, so, but I was wondering kind of where, okay, those were those were mentioned. Where was Christianity and all those different things? So, like, there's a lot of people believing in a lot of things. Where was the real faith throughout the thread? I mean, I think with. In this period, it was Paul. And, and maybe it was a very small community, yep. um, and it wasn't widely known, although it was being spread. So maybe yeah. it was a new thought. It Who was. Knows? It was a very new thought. Yeah. And Definitely. Paul, like the apostles were the people. To, like They yeah. were, and they were recognized like these were the disciples, the apostles of the Messiah. Uh-huh. They had authority. And they would go out. And they, we focus on Paul because we have his writings. But right. there was 12 of them. So they were. Right. But we only have really a couple of their their letters and stuff. So they were the ones that were holding forth the faith during this time. Yeah, this was a very Christianity kind of 
at this time. Yeah. Which is why I had to talk more about all the other things. All the other yes. stuff. Because that's what Christianity found itself in. <laughs> How does Christianity engage with it? it Christianity good. kind of erupts in yeah. a small. It goes very quickly. Yeah. It's shocking how fast it grows. But why is that? Yeah. I think it's because of them. Yeah. And, and it's interesting how it gets so downplayed. Mm-hmm. And yeah. all the other thoughts are more important. They're so cool and hip. It's cool to be a stoic. Yeah. 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 Beat them all out. <laughs> <laughs>